Um, this is item uh, with regard to enhance each uh, board member experience. And um, Dr. Kasuga is going to take on this item, but I would also like to invite um, Dr. Jacqueline Horn um, to, as well. Dr. Kasuga. Yes, uh, thank you, um, Board President Fu, and um, Dr. Horn for being present for this one. Uh, so I just wanted to take this, um, this opportunity to uh, share my experience taking the EPPP uh, pi uh, 2 pilot exam. And um, my goal for sharing my experience is to provide the board with information that may be useful as we further deliberate the future of our licensing exam, as well as to bring a fresh perspective with regards to our licensing exam process. Um, but um, I will not be giving any opinion whether to adopt or not adopt the EPPP2. I just wanted to clarify that. Um, so for the sake of our new board members, uh, our newer board members, the EPPP2 is um, a test that was developed by ASPPB, and it is a competency uh, test that is... Um, proposed to be taken in addition to the EPPP, which is uh, currently a knowledge uh, test that our licensees have to pass together with the CPLEE in order to get licensed. So um, is that a pretty good description of what it is? <laughs> okay, so, um, uh, so it, it's intended to, to make sure that um, our licensees are, uh, that they are able to apply the psychological concepts that they should know before practicing in the field. And um, so last year, the board uh, adopted to, um, I mean, uh, decided not to adopt, be an early adopter of the EPPP2. So currently, our licensees have to take the EPPP and the Cookley in order to get licensed. Just want to clarify that everything is still the same, stay, stay the same. So for the sake of um, transparency, I just wanted to give a little bit of background on how it came about that I took the pilot exam. So in September of 2019, I got an email from Ms. Sorek um, letting me know that the, the ASPPB is allowing a licensed member from each jurisdiction to take the pilot exam. And since I was the chair of the EPPP2 task force, she suggested if I would be willing to take the test, and I immediately said yes. <laughs> I think that my curiosity got the better of me because everyone that I told about taking the test thought that it was rather sadistic of me to subject myself to a, the licensing exam process. And um, it's, it's because um, I I'm just got licensed in 2013. So I took the EPPP in um, December of 2012 after my postdoc and then passed that with flying colors. And then um, I took the CPSE, which is the old the older version of the California exam that new people have to take instead of the Kapli. And I didn't pass that. I, I failed that like um, by one point. And it was like heartbreaking for me because I had to wait six months before I can retake the test. That's six months that I, I can't practice in the field. But like um, after I you know, got over it and, and you know, root, we, like, uh, took the test at the end of 2013, I passed it. But, like, um, that process I, that I went through um, made me, it's part of, like, you know, uh, part of the mindset I had when I took the pilot exam. So there are some things that I'm curious about, and, and I'm glad that uh, Dr. Horn is here to kind of like uh, provide some a uh, answers to some of the questions that that came to my mind as I was taking the, the pilot exam. So long background, but I think it's just important for transparency to kind of like share where I'm coming from as I 
talk about my experience taking the pilot exam. So in terms of the, the pilot exam, um, one of the things that, that I'm curious, I was curious about is the time allotment because um, when, um, when Dr. Turner was here the last time, he talked about um, the, uh, to his knowledge, the ECCP uh, allots a lot of time for, for people to finish the test. But in my experience of taking the ECCP, the time allotment is, is like not enough, or I barely was able to finish the ECCP. So I was curious if the ECCP2 will be the same. I mean, even though I passed the ECCP the first time, I remembered I had 75 items left and only 45 minutes, and I had to like cram everything in and you know like rush through the questions. And gladly I passed, but you know it's really I cannot state how much difficult it is to take uh, an exam in a language that's your second language. And I don't know how to account for that. I don't know if there are accommodations for that now. And maybe uh, later on you can talk about that for um, non-native English speakers. Um, and also, you know, for those that have, um, like, learning disabilities. And, you know, it's good to know what accommodations we have for people that... I, I don't want anyone to be disadvantaged just because of their, um, you know, uh, other aspects that is not the one that they're trying to measure with the exam. So in my experience of the, the, the pilot, it actually, I, had, I, I took a test that's a smaller version, like a shorter version of, of the actual exam. So it has fewer items. And I thought the time allotment was fine. But I'm also thinking that the stakes weren't that high. So that may be the reason why I, I was just breezing through it, you know. Or maybe I know more about psychology now than when I was like, you know, took it before. But um, the time allotment was was okay. Yeah, it wasn't rushed at the end of it. So I appreciate that about the test. Um, the the format of it is um, so they're diff it's not like a straightforward multiple choice. Um, there are items that are uh, there's like some matching type, um, you know test um, format, so um, so there, it's not just like your, you know, typical pick the best answer out of four. There are some where you have to pick two out of six. So there are different um, types of questions. There's also questions wherein it's kind of like a vignette. They give you a little bit of information about, about um, the, it's kind of like prog progressive questions. Um, so they kind of like give you a little bit of information, let's say about a client, and then you, you answer that question. And then they add more information about the same client and ask another question. And um, it kind of like simulates like when you see a new client for therapy, for instance, and then you only get a little bit of information at a time, and then you're kind of like formulating um, your kind of like uh, knowledge about, you know, what's going on with the client. So it kind of like simulates that. And I, I liked it because it's like, um, it's something that I think is applicable to real world practice. What, um, but then these questions, you cannot go back. So um, you have to um, really um, get your answer right, or else you won't be able to move on to the next item. And um, because, you know, it, it makes sense because there, there are clues on the second information that, that would, like, you know, spoil, spoil the previous, um, previous item. So I, I get that that's the structure, but it's anxiety-provoking when you're taking the test because you can't move on. You're stuck there. And then you're seeing your, the time, like, you know, it would be helpful if, I know how many of those items are, because if it says like there are going to be 50 items that will be, you can't go back, then I can budget my time 
and then you know feel more comfortable with with my my answers that way or if all of this you can't go back type questions are towards the end so you can go through the multiple choice questions and that you can review and go back to and then you can budget your time better i mean these are small things but when you're taking the, the test you everything you put everything into consideration and in my experience in one of those questions i actually rushed and i was um, stuck between two answers i picked the wrong answer because when i moved on to the second question i knew <laughs> that it was the wrong one but like now i'm like <laughs> I know that I already made one mistake. So it's like very stressful to, to, for me at that time because I know, oh my God, I messed that up. And if you are going through that test and there's like five things that are related to that and you keep on going the wrong path and then you realize on the last question that you just got four items wrong, it's just like, you know, um, it plays with your, with your mind. But, um, I think that there's like um, that the structure of the question is, has like you know has benefits. Um, so let's go through the content. Um, so the content, what's going through my mind is, does it really tap into competency? It, are these really things that um, that psychologists need to know in order to practice? And um, so that's kind of like what's going through my mind as I, I'm, I'm going through that experience. And because it's really important that no test is perfect, but you know we have to, if people are gonna go through this process, it has to be valid, it has to be uh, purposeful. Because then you know, we wanna make sure that it's doing what it's intended to do, to measure competency skills of like uh, Client, uh, of the, the clinician. So I was trying to really see, do I really need to know this information in order to practice? And I'm an assessment psychologist, so I'm, I still need to know enough about therapy in or, because um, it, does, it doesn't only have to be with the type of psychology I practice. I need to have like um, competency skills in all the things that psychologists are allowed to practice. So I'm keeping that at the back of my mind. So when the assessment question came, came through, I was really excited about it. Cause like, I was like, I'm ready to do this. But then I was a little bit disappointed and I've, I've spoken to Dr. Horn about it because the, the format of the assessment question goes like this. They give you like a raw scores of, IQ test, of an IQ test and this is what I do day in, day out. This is like my bread and butter. Um, I do psych testing. So um, there's a question at the end where it says, uh, there's a report at the end and they're asking, the, asking me or like the test taker to, to pinpoint what is wrong with, two things that are wrong with the, that's wrong with the report. And I was reading the report, and it's filled with like jargony words, like um, I can't say I don't even remember what they were, but they were like words that if a layperson receives the report, they won't understand anything about it. And that's not that's not how I would write reports. When I write report, I'm thinking about the audience and. You know, this is like a common rookie mistake for someone that just like graduated from from a psychology program who wants to use, you know, like uh, processing speed and like um, perceptual reasoning skills that like um, on a report, but like if we want real world practice, you want to write reports that's understandable to, to the client and, you know, like they need to know those concepts and I think that's what the EPPP is for, for knowledge. But then for the competency part, like, you know, we want to make sure that our like test takers know what like a real world report should look like. So that's kind of like my, my only comment that, you know, like the correct answer to that item is everything is wrong instead of like just two items. So that's, um, that's kind of like my um, one item that, um, that stuck, stuck in my mind. But I think that most of the questions are 
are pretty good in terms of kind of like the the information that is that they're asking for like even though I don't do therapy in my in my practice um, these are things that I should know so I think that those items um, should be tested for like everybody um, so in conclusion uh, what I want um, the board members to take away is that as uh, as board members Part of protecting the public is making sure we're thoughtful gatekeepers when it comes to our licensing exams. And there's no perfect exam, but um, we need to make sure that the that the licensees are competent and that this that test that we're using to make sure that our licensees are competent is the best test that you know we can we can give them because we need to make sure that they're competent. At the same time, we need to be thoughtful that the test is not putting arbitrary um, or unnecessary barriers for competent psychologists from practicing in the field. Because there's an access issue in California, and if we're like having them take tests that, you know, that doesn't really see that they're competent, that they're just like, because um, in my experience, maybe I was not competent by one point, you know, or maybe, I mean, I truly appreciated that experience to really, you know, um, go back and review um, all the law and ethics in California <laughs> to, to pass the second test, but it's also like a big burden for some people that, you know, really need the money to, pra to practice in the field and they're competent. And there is, it's a barrier for some people, for, for, for um, some um, competent clinicians out there that just, you know, are not good test takers or um, didn't pass the test. So, and the reason why I'm sharing this as well, because I know that I'm not the only one who had to take this test multiple times before getting in the field. And we have to think about that when we look at those numbers that the reports that we get on the pass rate of you know the EPPP and you know the COPLE, and also one of the things that I I uh, want uh, the board members to take away is um, as we further deliberate, uh, I think that eventually we're gonna we're gonna be faced with a decision on whether to adopt or not adopt um, the EPPP two again. We have to look at what would that look like for our um, licensees because, um, or potential licensees, because there's a lot of um, overlap between the EPPP2 and the COPLE. So we don't want to give our, our potential licensees three exams. So um, we have to make a decision in terms of what would our licensing exam look like at that point. But that's in the future. <laughs> And um, I just want to open it up to Dr. Horn to make comments. Thank you very much, and thanks for that. Uh, you gave, I'm hearing the kind of feedback exactly that the pilot test was designed for. Uh, it was to get this larger kind of feedback. So just to let you know, I don't know if you had questions like that at the end where they were asking you to write your comments or anything like that. but. That's exactly what the pilot test was designed to do, get this kind of feedback from folks. So thank you very much. And for those of y'all who don't know, um, I uh, work for ASPPB, the organization that uh, creates the EPPP, does some other stuff too for, uh, uh, for our membership, which, is the, which are all the licensing boards in the United States and Canada. So that's this hat. When I was on the board, I had to leave the room anytime anything was discussed about any of this stuff. So I'm uh, glad to be able to come and kind of respond to your feedback and answer some questions about it. So I guess, you know, the first thing I want to talk about is the, um, the, um, the issues that you raised about what if you, English is not your native language or, um, you know, are there time allotments? Do we allow accommodations and stuff like that? So, uh, actually, California does allow uh, accommodations for English not being the someone's native tongue, and we did that 
not too long ago, about the time you got licensed, actually, people get extra time for, um, if in, they have to take the TOEFL and depending on their, um, depending on their score, they're allowed extra, uh, they might be allowed extra time. And then for all the uh, jurisdictions, um, there are accommodations for uh, ADA accommodations, so if, if people can document that, that's allowed, and, and uh, you know, what's needed is allowed. And I'll just tell you that California has had um, uh, a lot of, because we try to provide whatever is, um, whatever is required and whatever is required by the report that's given or whatever, this is what this person needs, you know. So uh, we've had people who, and this is for the EPPP1, I'm going to say something about that. It'll be the same for the two, but we've had people who had to take the EPPP in separate sessions because they couldn't spend the four hours and 15 minutes, you know, because they needed accommodations for that. So as long as the validity of the exam uh, and the security of the exam or can, you know, if the accommodations don't jeopardize that, then pretty much any co accommodation is allowed. And I'm sure, you know, you've had, you've called about stuff like that, Ms. Sorek, and, uh, but, so that's absolutely, and, and I'm very happy and proud that California is one of the a few uh, U.S. jurisdictions where we actually allow extra time also for English not being the native language. So that's, you know, I feel really proud about that. I think that's something we did for the public, you know, for our consumers. Um, I, I do, and oh, and so the time allotment, that's one of the, uh, the feedback that we wanted to get uh, in the pilot exam uh, for, uh, is this, because these are more complex questions, you know, as you were just saying. And so how many questions should we have on the exam, um, given that they're more complex, they take more thinking time. You already have to have the knowledge, but then on this exam you have to apply the knowledge. And so you're not going to be given the knowledge, but, you know, and so that's what you're, you know, that's what really takes the extra time on this exam. Um, and so that's part of what the pilot exam was for, to see the timing on the questions. We figure those uh, complex questions like the scenario that you were talking about, it's going to take more time because, you know. Um, and so there will be 170 questions on the EPPP Part 2. Uh, 170. 130 of them are once we get every item pretested, 130 of them will be scored, and 140 of them are pretest questions. So the pretest questions are mixed throughout the exam, so you don't know which ones are pretest questions and which ones are, um, you know, the operate actual operational items. But every every um, every question is pretested. Nothing is put on there. I mean, nothing is scored that hasn't been pretested. And um, what we're able to add with the part two <coughs> that will be, uh, that ha hasn't always been there for the part one, but now we're adding it currently as of this year, is a differential item functioning analysis. One, if we get, if we see that different groups, because, you know, well, let me back up, we weren't able to ask about ethnicity or race before, um, and now we are, and uh, so in asking that, if we see that any item on the exam is uh, that there are differential scores and they're uh, eth ethnically or racially uh, based, you know, uh, then we're going to take those items out well. First of all, if I, if an item doesn't do well statistically, it's automatically out. But um, those items, even if they do well statistically, but if different if some groups pass that item or do well on that item and some groups don't, we're going to take a look at it and send it to a. Um, we have a panel of subject matter experts, but who are all experts on diversity, and who will 
take a look at that at the time and say, you know, there, this is a problem or it's not a problem, you know, uh, and you either have to change it or you can use it like it is. So that's the final thing. But I do want to talk about every, the item review, if that's all right with y'all, just about like how each item is reviewed. So aside from the things like, is this important to practice? Is this what uh, new psychologists need to know? Is this what they need to be able to do? And, and critically, is this important for public protection? Because that's also part of the writing every question. Um, then what we also say, is this fair for every group? So are stereotypes used? You know, if they are, um, you know, we don't want that, you know. So even it might be something inadvertently, and I don't want to uh, get into it, but I'll, I'll, I'll tell you this one thing that one, and, uh, that one of the um, exam committee members uh, had noticed um, was that we weren't using ethnicity in the, new, in the early items unless it made a difference in the question. And this uh, exam committee member said, when somebody walks in your office, that's always part of what you're going to consider. So it's always part of the total picture, whether or not you decide that it's important to what you end up doing, it's still something that you always have to consider. And so she said, so if I read that, and this woman was an African American uh, woman, she says, if I read that, I'm, and it doesn't say ethnicity, I'm reading a white psychologist. You know, I'm thinking white. And she says, you know, if it doesn't say anything about a client, I'm thinking white, you know. And she said, and that's just implicit in the exam. So again, every step of the way we had this thing. So now it's always part of the questions in the exam, I'm not, in the exams, because that's always part of what a psychologist has to be looking at or considering you know, as somebody walks in your office or you're assessing somebody or anything like that. So that was great feedback. So one of the things ASPPB has done is given um, implicit bias training to all the item writers and to all the committee members uh, who are serving, who are helping uh, with this exam. And the woman um, who's given that training, um, is a psychologist herself, and uh, she was really interesting. I, I sat in on two, because I go to a lot of these meetings, so I was, uh, I attended twice, and it was just, and it was, it was kind of basic, and most of us have been exposed to that, certainly somewhere in our training. Um, but it was really, really, interesting in terms of getting in touch with my own ways of thinking, you know, me, no, you know, and just things that, you know, because it's implicit. I don't know I have it, and there it is, you know. So um, anyway, so the, the fairness issue, including if English is not, you know, someone's native tongue, that goes into every step. So an item is written by an item writer, and by the way, we have I think six, uh, we have 70 item writers. 20 of those item writers are from California. I just want to let you know what a large representation we have of folks working uh, from California. This, these are just the item writers. And I want to just tell you where the California item writers come from. Uh, we have Pepperdine, we have people from Pepperdine, people from Berkeley, people from Alliant, people from Stanford Children's Hospital, USC, UCLA Counseling Center, number of people in private practice, <coughs> UCLA Psychology, uh, Azusa Pacific, uh, the prison system, uh, the LAPD, uh, UC Davis Medical Center, interestingly, and uh, Cal State SLO. No, and, okay. huh? Nobody from JFK, but you know, doesn't mean there can't be somebody from JFK who's, <laughs> or he went. So this is where they are now, 
I don't know, you know, where they got their training or anything like that. But just to let you know that we've got, like, that's over a quarter of the item writers, right, are from California. On the exam committee, and y'all know some of these uh, psychologists. I mean, they're known to, they're known. <laughs> so let me just say. On the exam committee, we have two California psychologists. And um, on the item development committee, we have one California psychologist. And the item development committee are subject matter experts in the areas that the ECCP2 tests. And so you can go on the ASPPB website and see the competency domains. Um, and those um, people on the item development committee have shepherded the item writers in terms of writing, um, writing items. So an item writer will write an item and turn it in. And it gets turned in on this over computer, so everything's secure and, you know, and everything. Um, then the uh, group lead, the item development committee, reads the item and might say, well, this is good, it's a good idea, but it seems more knowledge to me, or this seems a little jargony. And by the way, I will say the pilot exam is, these were early questions that were written, so, you know, the, as it's, it's gotten better. But the, you know, so the, the uh, IDC member might say, well, this feels a little jargony, but it's a good concept, so, or it seems a little knowledgey. Can you make this skills, not knowledge, you know? And um, so then the writer will get it back and rewrite it. And it. So there's this iterative process until the item is accepted and it goes into the item bank. Then the uh, exam committee, um, Pearson View, who's the vendor, so people have heard of Pearson. They do a lot of the psych tests that if we, are, if we do psych assessments, we get a lot of the tests from Pearson. But they're the exam vendor. And so they put together a test based on uh, the blueprint, which is 170 items and this many from each domain, and we have a certain number of scenarios like you're talking about, and a certain number of just straight multiple choice, and by the way, the multiple choice has three possible options instead of four, because if y'all have ever created or written a test, that fourth option is really hard to <laughs> come up with, you know. And, um, and there's no difference statistically and reliability-wise between three options or four options, so anyway. So, and there's plain multiple choice, but then there are these other kinds of things, like uh, it might be a, a letter or something, and it's like, and it might be a question on ethics, but it might be what in this letter is unethical, and you have to, you have to know. So you have to know the ethics code, but then you have to say, well, this part right here. So you have to know what's unethical, and then you'll point to it, you know. Or you might have had the business card where somebody, yeah, on his business card, he put stuff. I think you saw that at the ASPPB meeting. So anyway, so I, but it goes back and forth. And then the final review when it gets put together is the exam committee. And they go over every single item. And it also is subject matter experts in each of the domains. So they'll go over every single item and say, um, and they'll accept it, or they'll say, this needs work, or they'll say, this, you need to start all over again. So it has all these different levels of review at all these, and looking for all these things, you know. It, this may be a great question, but I don't expect any inner, you know, beginning psychologist to have to know this, so, but it's gone, you know. And then, of course, statistically, everything is pre-tested, so. <coughs> Only the questions that actually do show us what we want to see are the ones that are used and are scored. So that's the process, you know, and I think that gets to a lot of the things that you were talking about. Another thing, too, that, I, uh, that just um, came to my mind is um, double negatives. Yeah. Those are, like, um, the worst thing for a non-native English speaker. Yeah. <laughs> Just like, what is this question asking? Is it like what not or what is? And I think that even people that 
don't have English as a second language have problems with those double negatives. Yeah, and they are always in, in exams. And um, yeah, it just like adds another Follow, layer. Following except, you know, stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, so uh, as another layer that, you know, is completely <clears throat> torturous for people that are taking the exam. That's a great point. And actually in our style guidelines, it says not to do that. So our style guidelines, which I wrote, by the way. I mean, I'm... I'm Shocking. <laughs> just to let you know. Just to let you know. <laughs> um, that's one of the things we say. Because for someone for whom... It, it's hard enough anyway, you're exactly right, but for someone for whom English is not their native tongue, those are bears. You know, it's very confusing. And we don't want... We want to really test people on either their knowledge, the EPPP, or their skills, the part two. And we don't want to test their reading comprehension. I mean, that's not what it's for. <laughs> that's not, we don't not want to. <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. So it's really constantly, you know, is, is this straightforward? Can people understand this and all like that? Um, what I also appreciate that you talked about in terms of the scenarios and what I'm going to take back is the anxiety when you realize going through it like, uh-oh, I, I, did, I didn't rule out the right thing, you know, or whatever. But, um, but those were exactly to mimic how a psychologist gets into a case. You know, you only have a certain amount of information at first and then as you begin to get more information, you narrow down what you do or revise what you first did or, you know, something like that. So, uh, but that's exactly it because the chief complaint about the EPPP now is that it doesn't, it's not at all what I do, you know. And so the reason for this was to make it an exam that is more like what psychologists really do, you know. So, anyway, so. Are there any questions from the board for uh, Dr. Kasuga and Dr. Horn? It's less a question, I guess, than a context. Um, just so people understand, the licensing process has evolved over the years. The original licensing exam, we took a knowledge-based test, and then people would take an oral examination. I was, thankfully, the first, I was the first year there was no oral examination. Uh, yeah, I was lucky. I was sick because it's like, I had to walk through that. <laughs> <laughs> but what had happened with the oral examination is people were questioning whether it was really an objective test of, of the ability to apply knowledge because you had a panel of two, two, I guess, two examiners in the room with you, and those examiners might come to a different conclusion than if you sat in front of a, a different panel of two, two examiners. So it was hard for the state or for states to any longer defend having oral examinations. So we took the applied part out of the examination process. This effectively puts the applied part back into the examination process, but does it in a way that's statistically defensible. So um, I think that's the logic behind having the EPPP2, which I guess is now called the enhanced triple EPPP. No, it's called the oh, is it still called top part two? Okay. Um, or maybe the whole thing is called the enhanced. Not anymore. Okay. I know it's It's says, hard to follow the terminology. There are a lot of names. Do you have a brand manager? Um, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, um, so I think it's important to understand that because I think it is important for us as a board to have some way to see that people do have the ability to apply knowledge. And we haven't decided that this is the way that we necessarily want to adopt as a board, but it is a way that, that the field is attempting to address the fact that we're not doing applied skills and we're not using, it's not a skills-based test as opposed to a, uh, there needs to be a skills-based component to it. So I just wanted to mention that as you were talking about it, it occurred I to me. I think the history is really important, I, I think, uh, actually, the reason ASPPB undertook this was because boards were getting rid of their oral exams and didn't have something to put in the place of it. And this is standardized, so, uh, you know, there was thought like, well, why not supervisors' ratings, for example? And uh. there's this very classic article in, that was in the American Psychologist called Where Are the Other 90%? 
and it's uh, because everybody, it's, this is, person is in the top 10 people I've ever super, or top 10 percent of people I've ever supervised. So this was, and that's, supervisors are very reluctant to serve truly as gatekeepers because they don't want their students not to be able to get a good internship or, you know, so they're very reluctant to say, this person really shouldn't be going on or, you know, or that person has gone through this much school and spent this, you know, is in debt this much money. And uh, so there's a real reluctance there. So our jurisdiction, the ASPPB jurisdiction said, develop something that is standardized and, uh, you know, objective and that everybody is measured by the same yardstick, basically. So. I think I saw Dr. Rogers and Mr. Vantes have comments. Thank you for being here, Dr. Horn. <laughs> I have um, some questions for you, and I'm glad that you mentioned about looking at, the, through this exam, looking at uh, item by item and uh, some of the categories of who, of where there may be bias. As you know, I'm an education researcher where there is a lot of evidence about standardized exams, re uh, creating bias in our education system. So I certainly care about this. I'm curious about, um, is there a, a, what are some of the ways um, by item and even test wise, or like the, the whole of the test, to look at some of these uh, categories and where there may be individuals disadvantaged, like uh, what uh, groups and categories um, is ASPPB looking at? Because there are many, but it's impossible to test for everybody. So can you talk a little bit m in more detail about that? Well, it really depends on who takes the exam. Uh, I mean, that's what we're looking at. So it, it, it definitely has to be, first of all, I want to also say for the EPPP for the part one, which will be called the part one, which is the knowledge exam, it's also an item by item review. And that happens on both exams. Oh, okay. And they're both gone through for the same thing. But the differential item functioning, uh, which is this new part, um, that just adds an extra layer. So when, um, when we do this, if we see, so now we test ethnicity, uh, or not test ethnicity, but we, if people can let us know their ethnicity, it, it's uh, completely voluntary, so they're not required to, but if they do, then we can look, if we have a, a large enough in, we can look at, um, you know, is, is there a question that, or are there questions that a particular group isn't performing as well as other groups? Then we want to look at that question because it may be something in the question that we can't pick up, you know. Is, I, and is, is there other than ethnicity, for example, gender and age? Absolutely. So, um, the, what people have talked about the most mm -hmm. is ethnicity, and that's been the biggest, I think, complaint and criticism. Uh, but uh, we look at gender, we look at age, we look at um, uh, a lot of different kind of, you know, sexuality, a lot of different forms of self-identification, all of those are um, areas that we look at. Yeah. So item by item and for the test as a whole? Yes. And on the E triple, the uh, P, the first part? Yeah, the, the same. knowledge part, same thing. Oh, okay. Now the knowledge part is based on, it's all about research. I mean, it's mm -hmm. research that's been done and knowledge that's imparted. So it's a little bit different, but there can be something in the way a question is worded, like the uh, social psychologist expert on the, Part one has said, um, 
why is it you always have an Asian person who's got a physical illness or may not have a physical illness? That's pretty much of a stereotype, you know, that the Asian person, tra uh, like, uh, and obviously there are a lot of different Asian folks or Asian type folks, but that's a pretty much of a stereotype that it's an Asian person who comes in and their psychological problems are all physical you know, that they manifest them physically and stuff like that. Don't use, don't make this always the same ethnicity. So, you know, it'll be things like that or things like in a kind of a, you know, kind of the caricature of a, pers a person with a certain diagnosis. And then you make the, that person have all the, you know, be doing all the things like cutting or this and that and the other, you know, and it's like, well, then why did you make this person also, you know, something like that? Thank, thank you. And Ms. Sorek, if I can just ask, um, as we uh, continue to deliberate and consider the EPPP, I'd like to see some data, some evidence about uh, pass rates, uh, broken down by ethnicity in different groups so that we are making um, decisions based on data and not um, so w where that may exist I'm not sure and that's uh, information that um, we don't collect um, we don't ask for that information I don't think any of the Department of Consumer Affairs uh, boards or bureaus collect that data upon renewal. If people want to voluntarily provide us that information, we collect that data. And to the extent that people are willing to share that data, we can infer policy or decision making um, with that. But because I think it's fairly rarely um, given that data, would you say, Ms. Chung? Um, because we've kind of asked for that information to see uh, other renewal information um, or kind of messaging or sending out um, information to our licensees. And it's, the, the data is just so small that it, it's not significant um, enough, so. Could we get, could we get it from, mm -hmm. from, no? Mm -mm. No, because, no. <laughs> I, don't, I think that absent that data, it'll be hard to make a decision um, about the EPPP2 if we don't know how it's affecting the body of licensees in California and where we are um, maybe limiting access to licensed psychologists in California. So I hope well, there's some way that we can get some uh, information as we continue to deliberate? I, I, I think partly this is a legal question about what data we're allowed to require people to give us. People can give us data voluntarily, but we can't force them to identify themselves by ethnicity or other aspects of personal identity. So um, it becomes a kind of a catch-22 because it becomes difficult for us to collect the data because we're not allowed to. I understand, but I, in the aggregate, there should be some, there should be some evidence of, like, it, that, that, that we are not, I'm sorry, I got away from the microphone there. If there should be some evidence uh, for us to help us with the decision-making process so that we're making sound decisions wh wherever it may come from. So I would like to say something to address that. I mean, I agree we want as much information as we can you know um, and I can only say from the standpoint of creating the exam <laughs> it is not going to be a biased exam uh, I can you know in in all the ways that we can prevent that from occurring um, in terms of creating it and I think it will be a decision that the board uh, will have to make sooner or later, but I think it's also important to think about our licensees in terms of um, how, if this becomes part of the national licensing exam, then our licensees would be disadvantaged 
if they don't have to take the exam that everybody else does. So I think we're getting way too far ahead of ourselves, Dr. Horn, on that, because just from Dr. Harpsheets and I attending NASPPB, I mean, our understanding is that early adoption is this year. We're talking, a tw- and 2021 is, will be sort of the first time this happens, and we've conveyed our concerns that in our regulatory process, we need at minimum three years. You're exactly to right. Get. So I think, I think. And, and the ASPPB board won't be making a decision about that till 2022, so. So I think, um, but I think uh, Mr. Vonta's point about data and about the what is important to this board and to her should be reflected um, and taken notes. And so, and that, you know, if there's an opportunity for ASPBB hearing, having heard this concern, that if there's an opportunity to have some sort of idea where backed by evidence shared with us at an aggregate non-identifiable level, I think that might be appreciated. So one of the things that will happen once the test goes live and it is starting to be used, then we can do a lot of this. So we can get that information, um, you know, just, but it, it will tend to be more general uh, in terms of pass rates and you know, but uh, I think probably what also, I mean, I'll bring this back to the ASPPB board. Let me just say that, because I don't want to say things about him. But let me also say it is a concern that it be a fair exam to everyone who's taking it. So thanks for stopping me. No, no worries. <laughs> Mr. Bontis, did you have additional questions? <clears throat> I just want to mention um, with my legislative meetings that I attended on Wednesday um, from two members specifically, the issue of access to licensed psychologists, end quote, came up in their, uh, for their communities where they live. And so I I take that to heart. And it it comes in many ways, including the, the, some Are of these other, good qualified yeah, yes. including these other things we talked about. So thank you. Dr. Rogers. Hi, Dr. Horn. Thank you so much for uh, the information about the EPPP2. And Dr. Kasuga, thank you for your reflections. Um, I have two questions. Um, the first one is just a practical logistical question. So um, do licensees get a score for part one and part two, so those are separate. It's not an aggregated score. Right. Okay. And the second question is when you were talking about the implicit bias training, um, which I'm so heartened to hear, um, are there questions on the test that get the test taker to examine his or her own implicit bias or um, any questions related to cultural competence? Oh. Well, there are a lot of questions related to cultural competence, but <clears throat> different from <clears throat> excuse me, different from the E Triple P Part One, which is knowledge. <clears throat> this is ap- again, it's the skills part, so it's the application of the knowledge. So embedded in the question will be issues of cultural competence, for example, you know, uh, and the right answers will be. It will be that, it will be assessing that as part of, because the right answer, you can't get the right answer unless you have that, you know, so. Um, it's, you're not, for the part two, you're not, you're not, the test taker won't be questioned on cultural competence. There won't be a question about cultural competence, but it will be part of it in an assessment question. For example, you might, it, they might see, you know, here's a child that's uh, uh, Hispanic and, you know, comes from this kind of a home and blah, 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 and takes this uh, test and, you know, here are the scores and what does this mean? So you're going to have to know about, you know, how this population does on this test and, you know, would you, what kind of... Uh, remarks would you make or what kind of interpretation would you do or stuff like that. That's an example. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Horn and Dr. Kasuga.
for both for sharing and, and, and Dr. Horn, I know in the spirit of our former committee that we were on that I once chaired, which was outreach and education, I know that you carry that spirit of how do we increase, you know, more diverse populations and encouraging them to get into degrees that are higher, um, what do we call it, to get, encourage them to go into doctorate programs. And so we did see, we would see more diversity in our psychological field. So I just want to thank you because I know you're going to carry that for us. And Dr. And I'm excited now that Dr. Rogers and Dr. Tate is chairing and Dr. Rogers is on that committee with me. So we've got good stuff to work on. Thank you. Question for Ms. Sorek. So, do you have a sense, and I know that you may have to spitball this, but um, do you have a sense of what proportion of our licensees, when they, for instance, renew, are willing to identify their ethnicity, for example? I honestly have no idea, and I wouldn't even want to spitball that because I, I haven't pulled a report on that data. If that's something that the board would like to see, just out of curiosity, because I, I, I want to say this issue has come up in the past when we've talked about our licensed population, and I, I am a data geek as much as the next person, and um, the lack of data, um, I think uh, it frustrates an informed conversation when we look at uh, policy and policy that impacts our consumers and policy that impacts our licensees. So um, it, in this situation, I think we're met with the statutory limitations of what kind of data we can ask for. Um, and so we run into the voluntary situation, which doesn't always uh, garner that much participation is my understanding. I know medical board has a little stronger language in their statute, I believe, about um, providing that information. Um, but theirs is also, my understanding, voluntary. And we pulled their link, um, I think, to get that information. Um, so we're tapped into the same report on Breeze, to be technical. But um, so, yes. Um, I, I wouldn't know what that number is, but if we can pull a Qbert report maybe in the Breeze system to find out how many people have voluntarily provided that information, it may give us an idea of what kind of numbers at least we're looking at. You know, I know this is... And I'm totally volunteering that without knowing that that's a Qbert report that exists, but we can, we can look into it and see if that's something that we can pull. Because historically, this has been a source of frustration for the board, that we haven't been able to gather meaningful data to be able to look at these types of questions. And I, 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 sometimes the logic of not being able to ask or require the information kind of escapes me. Um, I guess people find it intrusive in terms of their privacy, uh, and some people don't want to identify who they are. Interestingly, when I look at the medical board uh, entries, they do give information, it is optional, and almost universally when I look, it is the non, it's the non-Hispanic Caucasian males who do not respond to the question, um, which raises all sorts of other questions about old white man prerogative, but um, I, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a curious experience because you would think that we'd be encouraged to gather that kind of data. So I've had it as a source of frustration, and I'm glad you introduced it. I just don't know. I, 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 I hope we can. there's some way that there's enough data that we can mine it. Um, Ms. Marks and I have had this discussion before, and, and one of the other kind of variables is on the other side of the coin. You don't want to give the impression that we're making licensing decisions based on the data that we take in about age or race or um, you know what, whatever the uh, self-identification piece is. Um, you don't you don't want that to ever come into question if someone does not get a license. So um, there there's definitely an informed data side of things, and then there's also the other side of things to consider as well. I can understand some of the logic of that, because that could give the appearance that we're doing something in terms of skewing the system to discriminate against people, which we obviously wouldn't want to do. Um, I do know that in one of our legislative visits uh, that Ms. Chung and I had, uh, Dr. Arambula, who's an assembly member, um, brought up the topic of better access in underserved communities and how 
he could work with the licensing boards to try to encourage people more at the community college or college level for people to come into the field so that they can serve the communities of color and other un historically underrepresented communities, including, as we found out from our data mining, that uh, rural communities are wildly underserved as well. So, um, yeah, I, I, I'm glad we're having this discussion. I think hopefully it'll be a discussion that we have on an ongoing basis. Mm -hmm. Before we move to Dr. Kusuga, Mr. Michaels, do you want to respond or have any follow-up comments? And it's in keeping with whatever uh, with what is being talked about in terms of um, the access issue um, versus the you know making sure we have competent psychologists passing this test. Um, is there any way we can help um, competent clinicians with the licensing exam process? Because um, you know I like to talk about real world. I mean, what's going on right now? I understand that history is important, but right now. Um, a lot of uh, the, the potential licensees that are taking the exam, they have to buy like exam preps in order to give them the best chance of passing. And these are expensive stuff. And if you don't buy these, there's, you're not giving yourself the best chance of passing. And in, when, during my time, I bought like, I spent $1,000 in test prep. And you know, it's, um, it really disadvantages people that, you know, are, don't have money, especially, you know, students that don't have money to, to invest in those. And if there's a way we can either, like, you know, if ASPPB can provide just like the test format, you know, practice exams. Um, those are on the website, so people can go to the website and get the practice exams, and there will be practice exams for the part two as well. Um, also will be uh, the candidate handbook where it tells you about the test and what the blueprint of the test is and all like that. You know, I will say, I mean, this is a larger discussion and it's not just about the test, but um, the American Psychological Association graduate student group did, uh, had a web webinar for, um, students of color in particular who uh, about taking the EPPP and passing it and it was a couple of hours webinar and just kind of talking so I do think people are um, working together to really try to I mean uh, you know to your point Ms. Cervantes is um, you know we always I mean we can see in virtually every standardized testing arena um, that ethnic minority groups do more poorly. They have a lower pass rate in every arena. The medical boards, the psychology, educational, you know, and so it's a, there's something about that, that uh, just about that whole process that is. And another thing that I wanted to um, ask Ms. Sorek, is there a way um, for us to do a pilot of the Kapli. That way, if, if we're going to make decisions about this in the future, it's good to kind of like have some information about, I mean, you know, if we can get that opportunity, or I'll volunteer too. Oh, to, to take the exam? To, to, to take the... Like a... Like to a see mock? the Kapli, yeah. I, I don't think we can do that because it's an existing exam. I think in this case, it, it was prior to an exam being established. Um, it may compromise the validity of the exam. I can reach out to Office of Professional Examination Services and see if there are some kind of test questions that are like mock questions that aren't gonna be in the exam that, yeah, like retired questions maybe. Um, I can certainly reach out about that, yeah. Um, I Just really quickly, um, a couple of things that have come up and I just wanna make sure before I forget um, we do on our website under the applicants tab have an EPPP practice exam. Um, we also have the candidate handbook for the EPPP part one um, so that candidates can look at the competency areas that are going to be tested. Um, we also have the law and ethics exam candidate information bulletin and that also shows the competencies that will be uh, tested. 
Um, as part of the regular course of uh, business, we always uh, do an occupational analysis on our uh, examinations. That happens every five to seven years. Um, we are currently due to be getting our occupational analysis on the EPPP and the CAPLI. Um, and we're holding off on the second part of that uh, so that we can let the EPPP2 launch and then get information from that. So I just wanted to share that with the board mm -hmm. that they will have an occupational analysis completed on the EPPP and they will be looking for any kind of overlap with the law and ethics exam currently in California and it'll be looking at the validity of the exam. So I just wanted to give the board kind of process wise that information and I'm thinking that should be probably done. I know they're doing the linkage for our current exam between the part one and the law and ethics in June, but then they'll probably be waiting a little bit longer for the part two to launch and then gather that data and then we'll get the complete report on part one, part two, and the complete. So just wanted to let the board know about those items. Consistent with that topic mm -hmm. of our own examination, I know we go through a very elaborate process of creating that examination through the Office of Professional Examination Services mm -hmm. with people that come in and suggest items and people that come in and take, the, take different items and break them down. Mm -hmm. I'd be curious when we next have a presentation from the Office of Professional Examination Services, what kind of work they do around the implicit bias that you're talking about because um, I want, think we want to make sure that that is also included, uh, those considerations are also included in the exam that we've, that we've created. Well, and uh, due to uh, modern technology, I know that the chief of the Office of Professional Examination Services is watching our webcast right now <laughs> as we've been real life interactive talking. Hi, Tracy, Ms. Montez. Um, <laughs> so, um, yes. Uh, she can speak to that. And we have been gathering um, data. I think this started at an outreach and education committee meeting and then overlapped into a licensure committee meeting that are uh, subject matter experts for creation of the law and ethics exam. We've been, as part of our application process, putting in the volunteer um, ethnicity um, information. And we've just been waiting to gather enough information to provide, uh, you know, enough of data to provide the board to see what the makeup of our expert pool is that is creating the law and ethics exam. So I just wanted to give you guys the heads up that we've got that as well. Are we also asking about sexual orientation and gender? I don't believe so. I believe we use the Department of Finance data um, for how they collect data on demographics in California. The reason, I, the reason I bring that up is because implicit, another implicit bias you can have in tests is what we would call a heteronormative bias, mm -hmm. um, which is that this is the way families should look, this is the way relationships should look, this is the way people should look. So I think that's probably something that we may want to try to put in the mix if we can. I will provide that input. I, I just want to go back to Ms. Cervantes' comment because um, obviously, you know, demographics are also very important to me as well. And um, I was just curious, and I know why we would be limited asking those kinds of questions, but does the California site, the, the CPA, would they have that demographic on their members? Or graduating universities on the number, you know, their demographics on the psychologists that graduate, I, I would think schools or other entities, and I'm just saying as we are on the now outreach and communications committee that maybe this is something that we could talk about, but just putting it out there. As, as both an academic and as a member of CPA, I don't know what data the schools are collecting or feel comfortable collecting. I also don't know what, what restrictions they have on that. So. But it'd be sure interesting to find out and maybe encourage them at least to get voluntary data. Dr. Kisuga? I have one quick question for Ms. Sorek uh, related to Dr. Phillips' question with regards to um, the composition. Um, are there, or, and I think it's for both Dr. Horn and Ms. Sorek for the Kapli and the, the um, test creators for um, EPPP2. 
Are there um, early career psychologists that comprise um, the, uh, the test creators? Because uh, sometimes, because they're the ones that have just freshly gone, gone through um, the program, and we just want to make sure that it's something that they actually learn from, from going through the program and not from the t test prep. And sometimes the field is evolving and, you know, like... 52% of the volunteers for the EPPP Part 2 are early career psychologists. 52%. Oh, wow. yeah. And in fact, the exam committee member who t just told us about that bias, you know, like if you read a question, it doesn't have that, you know, any things like that in there, any identifying characteristics. Uh, that was an early career psychologist. She was an early career psychologist. So. <laughs> How about for um, our test? Do we have that information? That um, early career psychologist on the um, test item creators. Oh, I believe we do. We, we should be able to report that back because I believe one of the questions we ask is how many years have you been in the field? And it's like five or fewer years. Am I correct, Mr. Thomas? I know that OPS does request that we do have a balance between experienced licensees and new career psychologists in that um, examination development process. Yeah. It, it's not always easy to get a good balance, but we do try to reach out to, to both groups. And I, I think, interestingly enough, the one time we had a, a skew in our passage rates where the passage rate was really low, we had kind of a overwhelmingly a uh, large amount of early career psychologists who were very in tune with the issues and so the questions were a little tougher and I think we <laughs> were making that correlation. <laughs> You're really hard on yourselves. <laughs> it's really good to have a balance. And, and, we, and we do strive yeah. to have that balance. Yeah. Thank you. I think you missed, oh, sorry. No, I was just going to comment. I believe that they do, that the uh, OPES does look for a balance because the idea for um, the exam is to test competency of an entry-level licensee. So I think Mr. Vantas had one more comment. Okay, in that case, I'm going to actually go to public comment for now to see if there's any public comment on, we've, on what we've discussed with regard to the EPPP Part 2. And I'm seeing no public comment, so I'm going to bring this back to the board um, for one last hurrah for today. I'm, I suspect we'll have many more jaunts down exam memory lane for many of you. Uh, please. I just want to thank Dr. Horn for coming and sharing her expertise with us. Obviously, she was in that position before where she couldn't speak to us about these issues because she was also a board member. But it's it's wonderful to hear from you. Yeah, I'm sorry I went on and on. You know. Oh, no, no, no. And you beat me to it, but I also wanted to <laughs> personally thank you. <laughs> thank you. Well, I really appreciate it, and you know, of course, I had to recuse myself and completely understand, and that was a, a pro you know totally appropriate that I did. But I'm happy to be able to clarify this stuff. Uh, you know, the, any questions that we have, so I'm happy to do that. So, thank you. <laughs> Bye, y'all. So I'm going to ask just to do a check. Do we want to take a quick break? Um, so a quick five-minute break, and then we'll come back here at um, 2.15. All right? So we are returning to um, um, item 21 with regard to the update on Sunset Review, and I would turn this over to... Dr. Phillips for um, item 21. Okie dokie. So we're just giving an update, Mr. Uh, actually, listen to you, the one that wrote the memo, you like to just give a little spiel? Sure. Uh, agenda item 21, which is the update of the sunset review. Uh, on the memo, it lists a background of the time frame from when the board received the sunset oversight, sunset review oversight form, which was July 22nd of 2019. And then in November of 2019, we presented, the board was presented with a draft of that form. And then on November 27th, uh, the approved form was delivered to the Assembly and Senate Business Professions Committee and Business Professions Economic Development Committee, respectively. Uh, and since then, we have not, well, 
until we heard uh, the date of the hearing. We had not heard any uh, feedback, and uh, but now we're aware of the date of the hearing, which I believe you're going to discuss as part of your yeah. Perfect. Okay. Uh, any questions? So on March 24th, uh, the Sunset Committee, along with the Executive Committee, which has some overlap, <laughs> will be appearing at the hearing uh, to respond to any questions that uh, the board might have. The reason for the sunset review process, as you've set out in your memo, is that every at regular intervals, the state legislature looks at the question of whether it makes sense to continue to have um, particular boards, bureaus, or departments, or agencies, I suppose. I don't know if agencies go through sunset too, but um, to make a determination whether it makes sense to have them, and if so, how well are they performing? Um, so it's a question of looking at our statistics over the time, at, in terms of what we've done with enforcement and licensing and other issues that have come up. There are particular issues typically that the, uh, the committee, which is a combined committee of the House and Senate, both of whom have business and professions in the name of the committee, um, there are particular issues that they will hone in on and they will notify us about those issues ahead of time um, and expect them to have at least parts of them addressed at the time that we meet with the committee. So uh, we're assured it's a more organic process this time. So we're not quite sure what that means. It used to be kind of a little bit clearer what we we're going into, but I'm sure we'll find out. And uh, we have a great committee of people coming to, to sp or a great group of people coming to speak at the hearing. Uh, Dr. Harb Sheets, Mr. Fu and myself. Um, and uh, then we'll also have uh, management there for purposes of, of addressing specific technical questions um, and data-driven data questions. So um, we're looking forward to going through the hearing. We went through it last four years ago. Four years ago, we kind of moved swiftly through the process. Um, we became aware that there are perhaps other boards that have bigger challenges uh, to meet, whether it's with their licensing population or in their operations. And those tend to take up a substantially greater period of time. But we don't know what this is going to look like this time. So we'll just go and find out and report back to you. But we're uh, hopeful that everything will go well. And then just um, as a follow-up um, to that report, um, typically we will get a draft uh, background paper from the joint committees, and that uh, background paper will identify questions for the board to answer. Um, these questions are typically driven around the new issue areas that we have identified in our sunset report, which you guys all approved at the November meeting. Um, so uh, hopefully there won't be any new items that will be kind of out of the blue for all of you uh, to see. Uh, that draft background paper um, will hopefully be ready for your review and consideration at the April 17th uh, teleconference as well. Again, a robust teleconference. <laughs> Anything else that day? No. Um, and and um, I think the other thing to mention about this process is that um, we have relatively short time frames to respond to things. We don't respond to the background paper in writing, do we? Um, there may be fact check questions that the committee um, ask the board and that would be small b board uh, staff um, just as clarification for anything in the sunset report that we submitted at the end of November um, just for clarification on any issues that may not be very clear um, so they will provide those fact check questions to us between now and when they submit um, the questions to us a week prior to the sunset hearing um, which will be March 24th so the fact check is something that you guys as a big B board may not see, um, but those are just clarifying technical questions usually. Um, there's also um, a difference in how this procedure is being followed this time in the sense that as part of sunset review, typically they consider, they include kind of non-substantive technical changes to licensing laws and so on and so forth. In the context of our sunset review, it becomes part of the bill, I guess, that 
by which we're approved for another four years of service to the state. Um, this time, uh, there's been a different change in philosophy, and that change in philosophy means that there will also be substantive provisions in there, particularly as they relate to pathways to licensure. Um, so we anticipate that that's going to be one subject potentially we're going to be talking about. The inclusion also of um, the work that the licensure committee did with regard to foreign degree evaluation is another item that will be also included um, as a part of that sunset bill. Great. So I think that absent any questions. Are, are sunsets generally four years? Is there a possibility that it can be extended longer, or is that like written in statute too? Um, that is all based on the discretion of the two business and professions committees. Um, I have seen um, in the way past, and this has not been in the recent past, but they went, I want to say, seven or eight years um, while they were changing the model um, because it used to be a truly joint committee of sunset review um, and then they kind of separated processes and divided the workload um, and had the assembly take on certain boards and the senate take on certain boards some boards that may have um, for example enforcement issues if a board has an enforcement monitor for example they might come up for review every two years um, Luckily, we have not been in that circumstance. Um, so we have been every four years, but it's not statutory. It's just based on the discretion of the committees. And I'll look to Mr. Thomas, who has more historical knowledge on this. Just a minute or two. Um, <laughs> yeah, when you're, um, I think we had gotten a four-year extension, and just due to the workload of the Joint Committee, they automatically extended us. I believe it was an additional two years without having to go through the sunset process. Um, so they just did a bill without actually having the sunset hearings and just to kind of adjust to their workload. And then two years following is when we went through our sunset process. Is there any more board, board, board on this subject? Is there any public comment or questions? Hearing none, I will return to turn this to the president. Thank you, Dr. Phillips. So we're going to take up item um, 22 um, with regard to the um, feedback for the ASPPB closure of practice guidelines. I think, um, Mr. Thomas, if you would like to come up for the um, ASPPB closure of practice guidelines. Um, and we'll go from there. Thank you. Uh, yes, um, back in uh, November, um, the uh, ASPP, ASPPB Professional Termination Task Force um, uh, distributed guidelines for comments, and Ms. Sorek sent those out uh, for that email to the board members, uh, not for comments back to us, but to the task force. And that comment period closed on uh, January 6th. And um, then that will go back to the ASPPB Board of Directors for a vote. So once the document is approved by the BOD, it will be back, brought back to this board for a future board meeting. Any questions?
it, it's often hard to determine where appropriate regulation by the board stops mm -hmm. and the standard of practice in the field starts. Um, this has traditionally, I think, in California been dealt with as a standard of practice mm -hmm. issue as opposed to a regulatory issue. Yes. Um, and I do think it's covered in our ethics code on continuity of care. Right. I mean, as many things are, that many of the things that we do don't regulate a lot of what psychologists do. It's the ethics code and what's the best practices in the mm -hmm. field, or right. at least the reasonable practices in the field. Right. Um, and I think it's pretty clear that people should have a professional will. That being said, I would say the majority of psychologists don't. I would agree. I would agree. I saw that, and I was a little bit concerned about that. As it relates to ASPPB, a lot of the smaller jurisdictions have such small administrative apparatus that part of the advantage to them as being a member of ASPPB is that they're given sample regulatory packages that they can, like almost like a model act, that they can implement as regulation. So it certainly makes sense for a jurisdiction that, for instance, might have one half-time employee constituting the entirety of the board, um, that it'd be to their advantage to be able to, to look to something like this. I think the luxury we have here in California is that because we do have um, a larger board with such a robust and uh, well-trained staff that um, we have really have an opportunity to kind of dig down into these issues in a way that a lot of other jurisdictions can't. Is there additional discussion on this item? Is there a public comment on this item? Bringing it back to the board, Dr. Harpsheets, any additional thoughts or questions? Um, thank you, Mr. Thomas, for well. that. So we're going to go on to item 23. Um, this is the review and consideration of the administrative procedure manual. Um, so I'm going to turn this over to Ms. Sorek um, or Mr. Glass-Spiegel. No, that's fine. We can play who's on first. Well, first of all, I would like to um, I would like to acknowledge the hard work of Mr. Gage, who is probably back in the office uh, listening to this webcast. So, thank you, Mr. Gage. Um, what you see is a an updated draft of the Administrative Procedure Manual. Um, Mr. Thomas, uh, Mr. Gage, and myself uh, went through uh, this document page by page. Um, and updated kind of some of the information like our mission statement um, and our vision, the committee makeups, um, taking information from our sunset report that was updated on the explanation of our committees, putting that in the administrative procedure manual, and then some other minor policy changes, um, updating the language and such on those things. Um, so I don't know how you want to take this if you just want to go not page by page necessarily, but if there are any edits or amendments, we can take those yeah. by board member and then go from there. Why don't I, um, without putting anybody in the spot, I can start either with Dr. Kasuga and work our way down this way, or we can start with Dr. Rogers and work our way the other way. Is there? <laughs> Was this a nose goes situation, <laughs> Dr. Kasuga? Dr. Rogers, did you have any amendment? Would you like to start with? Any questions or comments at this time? Thank you. Mr. Vontas? I don't either. This will be a novelty. I don't either. Dr. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Gosh, I hate to spoil the party, but I have comments. Uh, <laughs> so on page 16, um, under uh, duties of, or the uh, duties of the board president and vice president. Um, it says there that on page 16, I would say the fourth bullet point for the president says chair the sunset review committee, which includes the vice president and key staff, meet with staff, etc. I would recommend that we strike out that bullet point because the sunset committee this year is actually chaired by Dr. Phillips. Um, and it was a scenario which I think was a reflection of last year's composition, but for continuity of getting us through a fairly complicated process with 
the legislature to have some continuity of leadership there. So I would make that recommendation to strike that out. And it's also inconsistent with the, um, with page 20, gosh, um, with page 18, which says that the board president determines com committee composition. So you'll have an administrative manual that, so you have two points in conflict with each other. Got it. Well, and then I think you would want to change under duties with vice president, serve on the Sunset Review Committee with That's board president. Exactly. Right? You must have read my notes right uh, here. That says page uh, 16 and 17. Uh, uh, because I guess then, too, you could potentially have three people and then run into that other issue of mm -hmm. meeting so. three board members. So I would recommend that we strike out both 16 and 17, the references to Sunset Committee, to be consistent with page 18 with regard to the composition of committee and appointments. Okay. Yes, Dr. Rogers. I'm sorry, I changed my mind. Um, I do have one comment on page 17. The second bullet point where it says coordinates with, maintains, should, that, should there be an and there? It's just a s small grammatical. Which uh, paragraph? Um, let's see, we're still under vice president? Yeah. So that's four point under vice president. Okay. And yes, coordinates with and maintains. If we can mm -hmm. add that. Thank you. Actually, do we need the word with? Coordinates and maintains. Well, yeah. Mm. No, the width is coming later already. Yeah. Yeah. With there. And it shows the width shows up already in the paragraph we sent to the person. Yeah. So just oh. coordinates and maintains. Yeah. yeah. You know, Dr. Horn will be so proud of us right now. Spirit, Dr. around right here. Yes. <laughs> um, so just to summarize to the point up to now. Um, we have on page 16 striking out the sunset reference, on page 17 striking out the sunset reference, on page 17 making a change to the second to last bullet point under vice president to state coordinates and maintains regular communications with the president. Then I have a question. Yes. The, um, on the last duties list, the last one, last bullet point under president, Okay, this is the grammar thing. I might be totally embarrassing myself. But where it says otherwise prescribed, is it proscribed by law or prescribed by law? P R O. That word instead of prescribed, P R E B P R O. So page 16. Okay. So uh, 152 out of 161 on the combined PDF, and then. And it's it's right last, above C Appendix H. It's last the last bullet point. Of Oh, an otherwise prescribed law, as you say. I have prescription uh, power. <laughs> With at least the law. Well, you might prescribe or proscribe. Um, a fine. Is it, oh, you might want to do a fine. Regular to the doctors to see if that, prohibited by that word shows up again. Oh, yeah. Other otherwise prohibited. Is it? Well, are you talking about prohibitions? Or you're talking about proscribed or proscribed as it's set out in law. I believe this was Dr. Phillips. I know it's on So I was going to ask your thoughts on editing, how what you felt comfortable with. I felt proscribed. Okay. Is that what you were asking? Was it prohibited or proscribed? What, what was the message? Proscribed. Okay. Are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> Final answer. Well, um, because I'm thinking of dele possible delegations. Because there could be delegations.
So the last bu bullet point under President will say, assume responsibility, responsibilities usually vested in or customarily incident to the Office of President and otherwise provided by law. Dr. Tate, do you have any um, amendments or um, comments on the manual? I do not, but and thank you for the hard work on it, though. Ms. Bernal? Okay. Great, thank you. Dr. Kasuga? None, thank you. Okay. <laughs> yes, Dr. Rogers. On page 18, uh -huh. um, under Chapter 7, Board Committees, um, should that be Outreach and um, Education Committee? Or is that Outreach and Communications Committee? Oh, okay. Thank you. The, actually, to, but for clarification, Dr. Rogers, did you see outreach and education elsewhere? And is that why you thought that was it posted on a website somewhere? Or no. okay, joined the board. I was assigned to the outreach and education committee, so I thought that was the working name. Welcome to the outreach and communications committee. Okay, thank you. <laughs> There was a name change in the last 60 days that I wasn't aware of, so I apologize if I misled you astray. Um, so I, I take responsibility for that. Um, so sorry, Dr. Tate, as the chair of the Outreach and Communications Committee, and apologies to you, Dr. Rogers, for leading you astray with that invitation. Um, so do I have a, can I have a motion to make the am described amendments? Oh, sorry, Ms. Marks. So, uh, Mr. Fu, I had forwarded some um, oh, yes, suggested right. edits to you yeah. and to Ms. Sark. Uh, most of them are um, grammatical. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you want me to go over them. Yes, right? please do. Yes. That, yes. Start. Okay. Uh, then I'll have to go back to the top of my comments. So on page, uh, well, I have the combined um, materials up. So it's 140 of the combined materials, chapter one under mission. It's, and I look, went and looked at the board's website. It says the board of psychology and then parenthesis says board. Mm -hmm. But I wasn't actually sure that's part of the mission statement because it's, that's usually what we do when we refer to it farther on. So, so I wasn't sure. Um, in the uh, paragraph, called overview. It says the, the second sentence is the Board of Psychology is one of 30 regulatory entities, which it should be that, I think. Mm. Oh, you know what? And we should update the number. Oh, that, it's more than oh yeah, 30. like 40 or something. I don't know what it is. 36, but, yeah. I think, or 36. Yeah. <laughs> Does one need to have the number in here so that you're not updating, checking the number. every year? Can you just say is one of? <laughs> <laughs> Many? A bunch. <laughs> One of several. <laughs> so just so that we're not worried about updating the number on a periodic basis. Luckily, it doesn't change too frequently. <laughs> uh, I, I'm not quite sure if you need to address this. A couple of sections down under the board it has bullets and it, the first bullet is license and renews licenses and then the one fourth bullet is investigates complaints and takes a disciplinary action. Do you, do you want to address applicants and under licensure in terms of licenses that decides who's fit for licensure? Did you want to add something about that or no? Was that subsumed in the first bullet? I'm sorry? Is that implicit in the first bullet? That's my question is do you need to to address that at all? Say more about licenses? Say more about yeah, uh, a, a, applicants, reviewing yeah, applicants for, for, for eligibility and fitness. Mm. I don't know if you really need that or if it's encompassed under licenses. Implied. Okay. Um, and then a little further down. Under composition, where's my note? You, I would suggest you add section 2923 because that's where c 
con it's contains the limits on uh, public members, the restrictions on public members. Um, it's on page 141 of the combined under board member orientation training. It says every newly appointed board member, DCA also interprets that to apply to reappointments. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you want to be clear so on that because that's how DCA interprets that. <clears throat> On page 142, under chapter three, the first section, frequency of meetings, the second sentence starts with special meetings may be called because the um, Open Meetings Act actually has a category of meetings called special meetings. You might wanna call those additional meetings mm -hmm. to not confuse that with a special meeting under the OMA. On page 143, under um, under public notice information at board meetings after uh, just above quorum, my comment was that it, I didn't think the paragraph um, really flowed because it talks about a closed session um, and then it talks about. Um, I just didn't think the paragraph flowed, and I could, I could give a suggestion to Ms. Sorek later if you're open to that. Uh, and then I think after that on page 145 under per diem, you cite to 103. I would suggest you also cite to 2935 since that's where it specifically allows per diems for board members of this board. 29, 29.35. 29.35. Oops. I'm also in, a, in that oh, same right. paragraph on per diem, you have a closed quote at the end of the second paragraph, but I don't, don't see where the open quote starts. E.G.? The I'm same sorry? one under board policy? Under per diem? Oh, I'm sorry. That, we, uh, that I had just referred to. Yeah, I'm sorry. I see a closed quote at the end of the second paragraph after regular em public employment, but I don't see where the open quote starts. Yes, Dr. Kazuga? I'm sorry. I have a question after. Um, oh, okay, understood. After. Sorry. Is it about what we're on now? Um, I'll, let, I'll let you finish here since you're in the groove. I'm sorry? I'll let you finish. Oh, I think, okay. Um, on one, one page. About the prints that she was asking about? The quotes, the quotes. Uh, so close, oh, yeah. it was a close quote, and I, I couldn't find where the open quote was. Got it. Um, under, on page 146, under travel reimbursement and, and payment per diem, uh, I, I, I was going to suggest that the first, par the second paragraph of, second sentence of the first paragraph be moved to the last paragraph um, but again, that be, could be something that I could just send to Ms. Sore because I think it'd be difficult to explain how, unless I just um, read it all and I don't think that that's necessary. Uh, uh, on page 148, under officers of the board, I didn't see anything 
in Section 1750 of the Government Code about election of officers, so I'm not sure if that's the right citation. I'm sorry, what page? Uh, 148 of the combined. You couldn't find anything on 2925, you said? No, no on Government Code Section 1750. So that, that I w I'm not sure if it's a, a, the correct citation or if I'm reading something wrong. So I don't know where that came from. I didn't look. Um, on page 150, under gifts from applicants, it refers to honoraria payments. Well, first there's a typo there, I think. It says the Political Reform Act 1. Is that a typo? Okay. And then it refers to honorary payments too, and I think that two is probably also a typo, but I wasn't sure if it was redundant, if honoraria actually means a payment. So I don't know if that's redundant. Um, you might also, I think up above you refer to the Political Reform Act and you give the government code citation, but I think as it goes down, you lose any reference to the government code, and so you might want to put in there that it's government code. Oh, um, where was that? It was, I'm sorry, page 150 also underneath that paragraph I was just talking about was the bullet that starts with elected state of officers, and then it just says specified in section, and at that point I think it's, it got a little bit lost that you're talking about the government code, so you might want to put in the government code. Um, on page 150, also down under number two, where it's numbered about gift limits, it says uh, the second paragraph under number two. So num number two starts with the 500 gift li limit, and then the second paragraph under that is a gift is any payment. You refer to a regulation that I, 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 I'm not sure what it is. I don't know what the what title of the CCR we're talking about, so I don't know if, if you want it to be more specific so that somebody could find that. And then on page 153, under performance appraisal of the executive officer, um, that first sentence, the second sentence, I'm sorry, says that the uh, department's Office of Human Resources will direct all board members to receive a copy of the valuation form with instructions to complete it and forward them directly to the board president, and that the board president will review them and collate the ratings. And I, I'm not sure that's entirely accurate. I think it, I, th I think it leaves out a couple steps. Um, I think what OHR recommends is that it doesn't necessarily recommend that they be sent to this board president. You can decide that. I don't know that OHR recommends that. I, um, and I don't think it's necessarily accurate to say that the president collates them for DCA. I think the way this board does it is you uh, get together, you meet together, and you collate a consistent response. Um, I. For, and, and that's what you do for DCA, and then you provide that to DCA? No, then I review it with the store. But that's, is that before or after the board meets? That's after the board. And I think that's the part that seems to get left out is everybody fills it out. There's a board meeting. You guys then sort of collate your responses, come up with something that incorporates all your comments, and that's collated, you provide that to Ms. Sorek and then potentially to DCA. This seems to su suggest, um, and we have, have had issues with other boards with this, where that coalition is somehow independent of a board meeting. And so I want to be clear that the board meets together, the board decides what the evaluation, what the appraisal will look like. And then that is provided to the executive officer, and then some form of that is sent to DCA. Um, Excuse me. 
Isn't that when we, we, we Ms. Soren steps out of the room, right? And then we review and, everything. And I go through the review of everybody's comments and plan mm -hmm. for the appointment and see if there's additional comments. Mm -hmm. And then we have Ms. Soren come in, mm -hmm. discuss some general comments. Then I kind of edit it down into a comprehensive document. And, and then that document is provided to DCA? Right. And I think the part that um, I think is, seems missing here is that that is done after a board meeting. So it sounds like you want to include a sentence in there that we should, inc that the board meets to discuss the um, co um, collated evaluations. Um, and then we can. On the board meeting. And then, and then include also that. Um, the board president meets with. If, if that's the more accurate description of how it's done and how you want it to be done, because as I said, we have had issues with what looks like board members, not with this board, but other boards where the board members fill out the uh, form. And that's the last thing to see. And it goes to the board president, who then right. on his or her own comes up with an appraisal. And yeah, that's somehow true. that's not done with the board meeting, and I think that is not how this board does it, right. and I don't think that's how you, this board wants to do it. So, so. collate forms, describe what the collation looks like, see if there's additional comments, and then I do a final collation at the board meeting. And then I meet again with Ms. Sorg, mm -hmm. so that's typically how it works. So, so maybe... Um, that's included. So, so maybe, Dr. Phillips, you and Mr. Fru want, as the outgoing and current president, want to... Rework that a little bit to uh, be more comprehensive. Uh, yeah, I was just wondering if we should um, m take the input from today, do an updated draft, and then give it to you guys in April, and then you can take a, a final look at it before we approve it, if that makes you guys feel more comfortable. Plus, we can work on some of the technical grammatical changes and whatnot. Mm -hmm. If you can send the stuff on um, Just really quick, to save us um, time and um, when we meet in April, because it is sounding like we have a robust agenda. Uh, could you um, highlight these areas when you send us a copy? Just highlight those areas that we specifically talked about this afternoon, um, just so that it um, is easier to see as we're thing. meeting, because um, I'm anticipating. Um, I just want to be ready when we meet in April. <laughs> Yellow and pink. That meetings in April. We could also put it over the next board meeting in July. Yeah. Because I mean, it seems like we're cramming a lot in four hours. <laughs> you can just say that as, as a member of the board. <laughs> so I know, Dr. Kasuga, you had a comment. Yes. I have, uh, it's more of a question, um, so on page 140, um, under the, the heading, the board, uh, it talks about um, registers and renewed registrations of psychological assistance, and um, do we keep it assistant for, for this one, or do we update it once those updates are? It's technically not yet through the process okay. for psychological associates, so mm -hmm. I, they don't think it's, this is the, this go around is the time to update it. I think once it's officially adopted mm -hmm. in the, um, in legend and, and yeah. regs, then we can go ahead and do that. Okay. And that, that would be the time <coughs> that, sure. that, that we would strike the registered psychologist too. And that's mm -hmm. that. yeah. Okay. Right. Thanks for that clarification. Ms. Marks, I know you were on page 153 um, prior to that. No, I gotta. Okay. With regard to um, board evaluations of the executive officer. Okay. Um, Goodness, why is it? There, it, let's see, there was one comment where it 
on page 154 under section government code 11126 uh, says it would be discussed in closed session unless the EO requests that it be discussed in open session. I think that request generally under that code section is only if only to hear complaints or um, uh, an act of termination. I don't think that generally there's a request to have the evaluation be done in open session. I don't know if you want to be more restrictive about that. You know. Generally, no. I have seen it happen once. <laughs> it was lively. <laughs> right. The evaluation itself? Mm -hmm. or, really? Wow. Mm -hmm. That I've not seen. Um, okay. Let us know if you want an open session to that. <laughs> <laughs> no, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> you Uh, on page 156, I think the submission and review guidelines for extension requests, I think I would take out the processes and just leave in what the delegations are. Mm. I, don't, I don't think it's really, this is where people would look for the processes. So take that section out. Where are you at? Oh, never mind. So uh, crossing out the, the submission guidelines, is that what you mean by striking out the processes? Yes. But keeping in the review guidelines? Yes. Okay. So we're striking out submission guidelines where it says to submit an extension request. And then you're that paragraph and the bullet points, but you're keeping the stuff under review guidelines. Yes, because I think that's the delegation part. I think that's the, the policy part that you'd want to have reflected in the manual. You need to change the title of that whole little section to take out the word yes. submission. To update the corresponding title to just review guidelines for extension requests. Thank you, Dr. Tate. And then I think this might be the last one. On page 158 under the appendices, Appendix C, the 2014 mileage reimbursement rates. I think I was just told we have new reimbursement rates. Yes, we do. It went down by one cent. Yeah. Really? Yes, it went from 58 cents to 57 cents, I believe. So I, I don't know what, is it dated 2019 or 2020? I, I don't, don't recall where I saw that. I don't either. I was deep in the IRS website for some strange reason and I saw that. Um, I think that's it. So it sounds like we're not ready to approve these, this manual just yet. So what I'm going to, um, I think, take from uh, Mr. Vonta's comment is that we'll have um, a copy of the suggested amendments and language changes um, gathered and, and visible mm -hmm. so that for our next meeting or the meeting after in July, we'll have something to look at and review mm -hmm. in addition to the rewrite of the executive officer eval. And what we'll do um, based on Ms. Cervantes's um, input, and we've done this with uh, statutory and regulatory language in the past, and it, it seems to help a more efficient discussion, is we'll just highlight the areas that have been amended or discussed, and then we'll present that to you guys, and we can go through the highlighted areas instead of the whole document. And if we can have a screen for that day, we can do live edits together again. <laughs> Bring back the good old days. <laughs> <laughs> Is there additional board comment on, on yes, Dr. Rogers? Just one question on page 146 um, or page 10 in the procedure manual. Uh, the, the first paragraph where it says attendance at events and then the next paragraph I think is the term day actually spent. Should there be a space between the end of the first paragraph and the beginning of the next mm -hmm. one? Okay. Yeah. That's all. And if I may make a suggestion that we also include Dr. Rogers in, with her um, Grammarly Insights as well, so that whenever what we get in uh, April or July, we'll have also passed the um, keen observations of Dr. Rogers so that we have those edits there too, if you're amenable to that. Okay. So, no, so Ms. Marks is not alone on the front lines of defending the English language. <laughs> <laughs> she has a companion again. <laughs> Are there any additional board discussions or comments? Is there public comment on this item? 
All right, seeing no board or um, public comment, um, we will take up. Uh, thank you, Ms. Sorek and Mr. Thomas and Ms. Glass, Mr. Glassbeagle. Um, so we're going to take up item 24 with an update with um, regards to Matthews v. Becerra. Um, Mr. Glassbeagle. Thank you. Uh, agenda item 24 is an update regarding the California Child Abuse and Neglect Reporting Act, uh, also referred to as CANRA. Uh, and mandated reporting, which is Penal Code Sections 26, 261.5, and 11165.1. Uh, frequently, the board has heard updates on the status of CANRA over the last few years. There is a uh, background sheet that explains the history of the request sent to the AG office um, by the board through... Uh, an assembly person or le a legislator, and I can't remember the exact, oh, Garcia's office, uh, requesting an opinion. Uh, that opinion has been held, and it was off and on while this went through uh, litigation. The litigation went all the way up to the Supreme Court for California, and an opinion was issued December 26 of 2019 and what the decision did was it remanded the case back to the first court to hear the case. Now, the original, the original decision by the court was that, it, that the case couldn't be heard because it didn't meet a requirement to be heard. So it's not that they didn't, that they're objecting or that they, they appealed the decision of whether or not it was legal or illegal based on the, the actual litigation, it was whether or not the, the case could or could not be heard based on the evidence. So now it's going back to the first court, you know, the superior court, and that court is mandated to hear the case. So we are effectively back at square one. I am happy to answer any questions, and Noreen will help me if I <laughs> misspoke on any of that. No, no that, was, that was actually very good. Um, to, to flesh it out just a little bit more, uh, the case involved the, a, a challenge to the expansion to CANRA, which was expanded in 2014, uh, expanded the definition of sexual exploitation to downloading um, child porn, and I think uh, the... Plaintiffs alleged uh, up that it, there was a constitutional violation of privacy to require them as reporters to report if a patient who they did not feel was engaging in any um, abu actual abuse, to report if they had um, uh, said during therapy that they had viewed child pornography. Uh, the trial court said there's no, uh, the way the complaint was, uh, was alleged, that there was no privacy right um, alleged to have been violated. The Court of Appeal agreed. The Supreme Court said no, there was a privacy right as it was pled and sent it back to the trial court, as Mr. Glasspiegel said, f for that issue to be tried. So there, was, there has been no... Um, no, ev no evidentiary hearing. It simply, the, superior, the Supreme Court simply said, yes, there's a valid complaint that the trial court can now hear. So those questions about whether or not a mandatory reporter has to report if their patient simply says, I have viewed child pornography, whether that has to be reported when there is no evidence of actual harm. In addition, the question about sexting has, was left open as well. Just to build off what Ms. Marks is saying, um, actually the way the statute's written, it appears that the simple uh, act of downloading constitutes grounds for a child abuse report. So we've taken ourselves out of an area where we know that a particular child's being abused and are able to identify who that child is, and we're now policing all patients that may be using child pornography and reporting them. The irony, of course, of this from the point of view of a practitioner is that if people want to get treatment, 
first thing it's going to do is we're going to dump them in the legal system and probably in the criminal justice system, um, even if there's not a specific child that's being abused. One of the complications that you were just um, relating to was that under certain interpretations of the statute, if uh, teenagers, for instance, in high school were sexting each other by way of pictures and they were downloading those pictures, that could constitute child pornography, so we'd have to report teenagers in high school for sexting each other, even though that's considered, at least in some neighborhoods, fairly normal, normal behavior. So um, it's, it's raised a lot of interesting questions. The irony of the case, I will say, just as a purely editorial comment on my part, was that this change in camera was made as a result of a movement among master's level clinicians to clarify what included sexual exploitation. This lawsuit has been brought by master's level clinicians saying that this impinges on the rights of their patients to privacy and impinges on the therapeutic relationships. So it's a mess. We've been asking about this since 2015. I think we may have started talking about it in 2014, actually, I'm not sure. But, um, and yet here we still sit not with anything, and as is, I think, appropriate organizations like the California Psychological Association is, can you give us any guidance? And the response to that question has been, we can't give you guidance until we know what the law is. We don't want to give you guidance and have it turn out to be contrary to the law, correct, Ms. Marks? And then, and so we're effectively telling licensees they can do certain things and that doesn't happen. Obviously, child pornography is a huge problem in our society that's grown with the advent of digital technology, but I'm not sure that it falls neatly within the area of child abuse reporting. Um, so uh, that's just a purely personal opinion, but um, having treated people with child pornography problems before, this effectively cuts off their avenues for getting treatment unless they're already in the criminal justice system, which seems kind of counterproductive. Thank you, Dr. Phillips. And I think it's related to that same issue that we were discussing even before Matthews about conduct between minors, minors where there is no uh, evidence of abuse in the clinician's um, and the practitioner's viewpoint. Mm -hmm. And so this was is related to it, and we've not gotten clarity from the Office of the Attorney General yet. And I think, as we've discussed before, there's a difference between the board getting a complaint and what the board might do versus what might happen if it's re referred for criminal conduct or criminal uh, prosecution. Is there additional, go, yes. It's a mess. <laughs> From the peanut gallery. <laughs> yeah. uh, is there, professional opinion, Dr. Is, professional opinion. is there any public comment on this item? Um, seeing no, thank you. Are there, <laughs> um, is there any uh, additional board comment? All right, seeing none, we're going to uh, move on to item 26 before Dr. Phillips gets new ideas. Uh, <laughs> um, item 26, this is for recommendations for agenda items for future board meetings. Um, note that the board may not discuss or take action on any matter raised during this public comment section. Um, except to decide whether to place the matter on the agenda of a future meeting per the government codes 11.125 and 11.125.7a. Um, I think from my end, um, Ms. Sorg, I certainly would like to see an enforcement report at our April 17th teleconference, uh, as well as at our July um, and uh, November um, uh, board meetings. Um, and additionally, with um, Perhaps this should be worked out between um, Ms. Cervantes and you, uh, but I, I think there's some questions about data, what data we can and can't have and why, and so um, maybe it's something that if Ms. Cervantes is interested in pursuing um, that we have a better, all, all have a better under, understanding of what's the landscape with regard to data collection and what are the procedures around it. And I'm not committed to necessarily having it at, the, at our four-hour <laughs> teleconference, but I defer to Ms. Cervantes and her, um, her thoughts on that. So those are some of my items that come off to the top of my head. Um, with the ASPPD um, discussion about CPQ, 
I'm wondering if that might be something that we should <coughs> use as an informational item mm -hmm. on, the, on the agenda. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Harpsius, can you share what CPQ is for our uh, CPQ, webcast audience as well as our in-person audience? CPQ is a credentialing program that um, the students may take advantage of and even licensed professionals who are interested in licensure mobility to another state. And um, so there's some discussion about not allowing regionally accredited programs uh, versus APA accredited programs in that system, people who graduate from regionally accredited. And California does allow regionally accredited uh, schools, graduates to apply for licensure here. So, how, so the question is how will that affect our potential licensure? It may or may not, but it seems important to that we discuss. Are there additional items for uh, the agenda for the future? Dr. Kasuga? Um, I'm wondering if we can get an update on um, the stakeholder meeting from uh, the licensure committee with regards to the, the educational, the LEPs versus um, um, our licensed psychologists. So when BBS actually came. Ms. Chung, um, the report from the licensure committee on the stakeholder meeting that we had, did we report out on that at the October meeting? Um, we had the licensure committee meeting where we had a presentation from BBS as well as the Commission on Teacher Credentialing where they talked about the LEP uh, I wasn't in attendance in the October board meeting, was I? Oh, maybe I was. I just don't remember. Not, no, not November, um, October. Gotcha. Thank you for the clarification. At the October uh, meeting. I believe uh, we did report it. Um, the, um, the original plan was to um, have a stakeholder meeting sometime this year. Um, mm. But I think we need to talk further about it, um, how to um, convene or uh, strategize this meeting given the resource available at this time. Mm -hmm. So I think that is the latest that I have regarding that. So it's not that we'll have that before the next board meeting? Oh, no. Okay. Um, but, we, but we did, um, if I can try and find the webcast where we did talk about the presentation, um, and I think it might have been in the meeting packet, the presentations that we did get at the licensure committee meeting. I think so, yeah. I remember providing an attachment. Yeah. Are there additional recommendations? <coughs> um, is there public comment on recommendations? Yes, there is. Please come to the microphone, sir. Thank you for hanging with us. Well, thank you. I feel like I'm batting in the ninth inning here. Two strikes. Uh, my name is David Person. I come here for the first time representing a, several hundred parents, uh, about 60% moms and 40% dads, who were erased from their children's lives uh, as a result of this uh, phenomenon we colloquially call parental alienation. <clears throat> and uh, we would advocate on behalf of better uh, assessment, diagnosis, and treatment of these children. And earlier today, we heard from the CEO of the California Psychological Association talking about uh, at the next step, step stakeholders meeting, uh, there should be stakeholders from all sides as well as a content expert. I'd like to recommend Dr. Craig Childress as that content expert. And second, I'd like to ask a question. How does one become a stakeholder, one's organization? So if I may, if we can actually have that as an offline conversation, because I'm not sure, and I would look to Ms. Marks, is because it says the board may not discuss or take action on any matter raised, am I allowed to answer Mr. Um, Person person's um, question about how he can be involved in the stakeholder 
meeting at this time, or should it be a conversation that he and Ms. Sork has after the board meeting? I, I, I don't think it's a big problem because it's not really a policy issue for the board. It's a, it's a pretty simple question. Okay, perfect. Ms. Sork? Um, first, I just want to mention the, the board at this time does not um, have any plans on having a, a follow-up stakeholder meeting um, regarding child custody issues. Um, when we did conduct the child custody stakeholder meeting, uh, we brought forth the two organizations that had um, had consistent representation um, for public comment at several of our board meetings over the last few years. Um, the meeting was convened to get a better idea of what the concerns were and who was responsible for what concerns. So what we did was we brought together state agencies um, so we could better identify who was, ha who was responsible for follow-up. Um, we had Center for, uh, or not Center for Judicial, Center for Judicial Excellence was one of the organizations. Um, California Protective Parents Association, but on the state agency side, we had Judicial Council, we had the Office of the Attorney General, um, we had the Senate and Assembly Judiciary Committees, um, we had the Board of Behavioral Sciences, and uh, our own board uh, present at the meeting. So it was primarily state agencies that deal with these complaint issues, and kind of triaging who was responsible for what. So that was the meeting that we had. We have some follow-up items from the meeting, and I'm happy to share that um, the recommendations that came out of that stakeholder meeting with you, if you would like. Um, but at this time, we don't have uh, any plans to have a follow-up. Uh, to become a stakeholder, um, typically coming to board meetings is an excellent way to become a stakeholder because if we don't know you, um, we don't know how to reach out to you. So um, I'm happy to see you here. Um, and if you would like information on the board, I would recommend you um, get on our listserv and uh, feel free to contact the board. Um, but that's the best way to become a stakeholder, I would say. Right. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Mr. Person. Sir, I'm sorry. Just a quick question. Did you give the name of the organization you're with? I didn't catch it. I did not because uh, we're... Uh, informally just a network we don't have a legal organizational structure and i thought that we may form one if it turned out we could be a stakeholder but thanks thank you mr person thank you. seeing no additional public comment is there additional board um additions to the agendas all right seeing no board discussion do i have a motion to adjourn and it does not require a second Moved. Um, moved by Dr. Tate. We're adjourned. Um, we have a teleconference on April 17th. Hear you then. <laughs>